I realize that students have the ability to do things that maybe other folks don't. You know, that if they're pitching their mayor or their school superintendent with a well thought out idea of what they want to do, that it's hard to not listen. Welcome to Climate Conversations. Before we get started, a quick note. If you haven't yet, please listen to episodes two through four in this season on Learning to Change, where we tell the stories of three groups who have modeled our season theme. We had to cut so much good stuff out to create those stories, so now we're releasing extended cuts of the individual interviews. We hope you'll like them as much as we do, and that they lead you to a richer appreciation for what it means to learn to change. Today, we're going to share our interview with Kate Arnold, who founded Youth Can as a history teacher at the Boston Latin School. We have Kate Arnold here, who is in her 19th year of teaching history, eighth grade history at Boston Latin School. She's also an advisor to several clubs, including Boston Latin's Youth Can, the Youth Climate Action Network. And we are so excited to have you here, Kate. Oh, thanks. It's good to be here. So what's the origin story of Youth Can, anyways? It's a very strange story from my perspective. I I teach U.S. history, and Mm. every year we do a mock trial about a German printer in the 1730s that started printing the truth about the corrupt royal governor. And I do a follow-up with students about how today's media is functioning because the media then kind of served as a watchdog on that government. And it wasn't, they didn't have freedom of the press then, but it was kind of the first inkling that the colonists had that that was something they really needed. Mm. They needed newspapers to be able to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And so we did a follow-up. I always call it Zenger's Zinger's. And um, we looked at how the media was covering a current issue, and I chose climate change because it was 2007, and I had gotten a copy of Al Gore's video for Christmas from my dad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I decided to show it to the kids and then have them look at how's the media doing covering this issue, and Mm -hmm. they were horrified. Mm -hmm. They were appalled. There was nothing being said, really, and what was being said was – you know, denials, Mm. big, huge attempt on the part of companies like Exxon to really confuse the science. And so they decided they wanted to do something. And they said they want one. They came out with three pages of stuff they wanted to do. One of them was form a club. And I said, you have to get permission. So they went, we we kind of prepared what they were going to say. And they went and talked to one of the assistant headmasters. And we decided we were going to start a club. We got permission. And I started taking a straw poll of how many kids were interested, and it was almost everybody. I had like 140 kids in my classes, and they were all planning on coming. Wow. My classroom wasn't big enough. I said, okay, so we're going to have to get a different space, and some of you are going to have to bring your parents because I can't supervise 140 kids at one time. So four other adults showed up at the first meeting along with 90 kids. Mm-hmm. Not bad. And we, we formed committees based on the lists of things they had that they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And one of the parents – of a student in my class was the associate coordinator for the Technology and Culture Forum at MIT, and she said, let's have a youth summit. That would be Trish Weinman. That would be Trish Weinman. Yeah, who we interviewed last year. And she's magnificent terrific. Magnificent Trish Weinman. Yeah. yeah, she's awesome. So she, you know, we, we started planning. One of the other parents said, you know, we're, we're calling it Youth Can, a climate action network. Why don't we create starter kits for other kids that come to this summit? so that they can start youth can groups at their school. So that group started doing that, and another group started fundraising. So we raised money, we put together starter kits, and within four months' time, we had our first summit at MIT with about 225 kids from 47 different schools. I was, I mean, (laughs) I was absolutely blown away. I mean, I was begging kids in the hallway, you have to come help me. You know, I'm lying awake at five in the morning thinking, what have I done? Uh Uh You know, and but it was it was wonderful. It was the most amazing thing. And that was 11 years ago, right? So last year was our 12th 12th. summit. Well, it's 11 years ago last January. Uh But because our first summit, we were only four months old. Oh, wow. The 12th summit was last year. So this year will be 13. So how many students came this time? 
we're, we've stayed pretty stable around the 200 plus number. The demographics have shifted, you know, back and forth from time to time. Sometimes we'll get a whole bus load full of kids from a particular school that has found out about it and decided they want to bring everybody. And then sometimes, you know, it's one or two kids from this school, that and school. And it's always this. been at MIT? It's always been at MIT. Sometimes in the status center, sometimes next door, but mm -hmm. always right there. And it's a full day of programming for those kids. So, you know, they get the speakers, they get the workshop leaders. We have exhibitors on the street in Stata. So, you know, they, they go around to tables and talk to people about the different things they're doing related to climate change. So it's, it's a very cool event. And do you think that your students now are more aware of the issues than the students were 12 years ago? I do think that as a general rule, just culturally, the awareness has definitely changed. I think those kids were scrambling to get up to speed, to figure out what the various issues were, what kinds of workshops might we include, who could we ask. And I definitely think there's a lot more awareness on the part of kids that, co that come new to youth can. They come somewhat now because they they know they're interested mm. a lot of the time. Although we still get kids that, you know, have not been as keyed in and come because there's a friend or they or they've heard it's great, you know, for leadership opportunities or they come for all kinds of reasons. So mm -hmm. it's not always that, but mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. say more so than it used to be, definitely. And I'm sure it's great for leadership opportunities. In fact, we heard that from some of your ex-students that we have interviewed. Yeah. I mean, these kids have done such amazing things. We had a guy call the mayor back when Tom Menino was mayor and say that he had heard us on the Today Show <laughs> and that he wanted to meet us. Come, He was in Paris on his treadmill when he heard that we were doing the work that we were doing. And, he, and he, he said he wanted me to call him, so I called. And he said he wanted to come, so he came, stayed for a week with one of the mayor's aides and a teacher and two students, and we took them all over the place, and then they paid for nine of us to go back to Paris for a week and present at his sustainability conference and visit their school outside of Paris. And, I mean, it was amazing. We went to the American embassy in Paris and talked about starting a, a group of international climate ambassadors, which didn't really get off the ground, but, you know, the dreams were <laughs> big and and. And really great. That sounds like a movie script. Way it is like a movie script. It's just like a movie script. It's like a movie that I was living, am living. It's just crazy. So over that time, I'm sure many, many exciting, interesting things happened. But sometimes there are turning points or places where you think, oh, my God, what a difference this made. Or this is really people are now getting it the way they weren't two months ago. Were there those moments or learning Turning there definitely the have been times when, you know, I mean, I didn't come to this with any kind of organizing experience. You know, I was a classroom teacher who always felt like I wanted to engage students in, you know, some sort of activism that sure. wasn't so political that it would be problematic for a, an eighth grade classroom teacher. What if somebody's parents weren't happy? And that did actually happen early on. Mm. I got some pushback from people, much less. I mean, there's nothing like that now. But I wanted to do something like that. I had no clue about how to do it. And I remember at one point, maybe three, four years in with Youth Can, students were coming back and saying, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of cr crap from other kids. You know, we've we've got such a big footprint in the school in terms of the stuff that we've done and the successes that we've had that people aren't liking us. They're sort of mocking us. And I thought, oh, God, that's kind of terrible. We had done huge events, teach-ins, you know, done things in the dining hall at lunch. We did things with costumes. We were raising lots of money. We had won competitions. You know, we won $25,000 in the Green Award and $15,000 in the Green Heroes Award. And, you know, so there was a lot of attention that we were getting and we realized we needed to scale that back in a high school. Mm -hmm. It's different than maybe 
you know, university, yeah, yeah, at a university level. Mm -hmm. But in a high school, there's kids have all kinds of undercurrents going on about stuff like that. So we had to regroup and think, you know, how do you put this where people want it? How do you bring things to the school that people will like and and feel good about? I would say none of that is there now that we really addressed that, figured out how to, you know, bring water bottle filling stations to the school and everybody thought, these are great. It was huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, bring things that people want to have. That sounds like a really important lesson learned. Right. And I also think a big lesson was realizing that it's important to shoot big. I, I, I really think that it's more exciting and you get more traction. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, you know, I realize that students have the ability to do things that maybe other folks don't. You know, that if they're pitching their mayor or their school superintendent mm -hmm. with a well thought out idea of what they want to do, mm -hmm. that it's hard to not listen to young people. And so there's a real place for them to make meaningful change. Well, the fact is climate change will affect them and their generation a lot more than us. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, you know, students are completely aware of that. Mm -hmm. I think the hard part is kind of weaving together all of the things that you need to know to have a really considered assessment of what's best to do because it's so complex. Mm. But I think, I mean, I don't know if they still face some of those obstacles you mentioned a little while ago of other students being a little bit upset, but I feel like that is exactly the kind of real world challenge that you need to solve, right? right? Because right. This is this is it's it's a problem that is not just a technical fix. Right. You have to think about how people who care about the economics of the situation and you know how are you going to make system change? I mean one of the things we've really thought about is that we need to be teaching students to think in terms of systems and how they're interconnected. Absolutely. So we've been you know pushing that kind of thing in our school and you know with with some success. You know that because it's a it's an old 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 school you know 1635 it takes a lot to deal with that kind of freight of tradition and you know i i think the in some ways the larger world is no different so so where have you found those points of success where in the school and the other fellow educators the administrators uh, students where are the places where you found hey there's a place where we can make this all more accessible and think in systems so i think you know with the annual teach-in that we've done although it hasn't been every single year because uh -huh. you know the bandwidth has fluctuated in terms of the ability to do that. But that's been one place. Um, bringing big things to the school that teach those lessons of sustainability, so the freight farm that we brought to the school that has people thinking about sustainable food systems. We brought a big giant globe to the library. It's massive. It's, I don't know, 10 feet in diameter. It came from mm -hmm. a museum. Mm -hmm. And I went to Vermont and drove and got it in a truck and brought it back because we wanted something big and visual and we put a big sign overhead that spans the entire wall of the room that says, you know, sustain sustainability starts starts locals or sport support. I can't remember exactly what it says on it, mm -hmm. um, but it's about the idea of making the school more sustainable and having the ripple effect of doing that. So there are all kinds of different things that we've done. We had a, an annual assembly for the youngest kids in the school. And I guess I've seen the biggest change there, that the people who, the headmaster that introduces us now talks about us as a powerful force in the school. That's something that students wow. should want to get involved in. And it used to be kind of acquiescing to the fact that we had asked again to have this assembly. <laughs> and now it's kind of a regular part of what every new student gets right around Thanksgiving time, uh -huh. there's this annual assembly that all seventh graders go to That's about the youngest change. Age, in, age group in the school, seventh graders. That's the youngest. Were they 10 years, 11, something like that? 12. Uh, they're 12. 12. Yeah, 12. 12. Oh, okay. Yeah, because my kids are 13 turning 14 when they're in eighth grade, mm -hmm. generally. Mm -hmm. And have you seen a shift in your colleagues? 
I definitely have seen people become more interested. I mean, the AP Enviro folks and the physics folks have been very supportive all along. We've also been able to hand off some of the things that we've done. So when we got three raised beds early on, we were able to hand that off to a a biology teacher who took over and created a garden club that that she was then in charge of. So I like that idea of of bringing something to the school and handing it off and having it become um, something that somebody else is doing. We did that with a wind study on the roof, gave it kind of to the science department, and students made that their own study with the anemometers. So I think if you, the more you can do that, you know, engage others with the things you have that they might like. I still have not found a way. There's interest, but we haven't managed to do it, to have the statistics department working with our building dashboard to have students crunching the real-time energy use and, you know, kind of engaging the school in what they're finding. But we ha- it's on our to-do list. Could you say a little bit more about that dashboard? I think our listeners would love to hear a so more what that's about. This is from a company called Lucid, and it was part of what we won when we put together our $75,000 proposal for what we would do with oh, okay. money in the Green School Makeover Competition. We said we would get the freight farm and we would get this building dashboard, and it tracks the real-time energy use. And it has a display in the main lobby as you come in the front door. And mm-hmm. you know, there's a back end. You can scroll through different screens and see different things about sustainability initiatives at the school. And you can look at the weather. <laughs> mm-hmm. You can do all kinds of things. But it's also set up so that students in a computer lab could access the real-time data and work with it and configure it in different ways and figure out what they're actually seeing about the building's performance and the energy use and so, and you could also hook a, a system like that up to the water in the building. We haven't done that, but but you know that's out there as a goal. And they can see themselves in that. How much water am right. I using? How right. much electricity am I using? Or are we using? We're planning to do a bunch this year because we worked last year in a pilot with the school district on an something called the Arc platform, which is a an online platform to track sustainability. You know, there are a whole bunch of different measures for tracking mm-hmm. how you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. from behavior to transportation to, you know, mm-hmm. waste and food waste mm-hmm. and on and on it goes. So we did Wonderful. some of that and yeah. we're going to dig a lot deeper into that this year. So let's say you're not from such a storied educational institution. How can you adopt some of these ideas? I still think that putting kids out front, you know, I think sometimes the mistake that that teachers or faculty advisors make is that they think students should be generating all this on their own. I always have felt like, how would they possibly know how to do that? I don't even know how to do it. So what we've done is dig in together side by side as though I'm one of them, except that I'm a grown up. So I can, you know, add a little more to the mix about how we want to write something or what we think we need to think about, mm-hmm. you know, to make something actually happen. How how much we need to prepare if we're going to go make a pitch to somebody, you know, mm-hmm. who's going to say what. So I help in that way and they have more success and they're way more excited because what they're going for is so much bigger. And I just think, you know, in any school, if you had a one advocate that was willing to work with kids like that and figure out something that they wanted to do that was pretty ambitious, that's a good place to start. Sounds like you're also giving them ownership. Yeah. It's theirs. You're Like you said, you're there with them learning and providing you know, your adult viewpoint on things, but it's theirs. It's theirs, right. yeah. I mean, I remember when Rebecca came and said, I think this year we should have, we should have a focus every year, and this year it should be food. And so we made videos about food, what's real food. We, you know, I mean, we, we did challenges in the dining hall. Kids submitted, mm-hmm. you know, there were contests about healthy food. We did a food fashion show. I mean, it was crazy. We wrote really cool copy <laughs> about the food fashion show. It was, food fashion, what does that look like? <laughs> absolutely hysterical. We were people putting we, bananas we had, on their heads. No, we had people walk, you know, doing a stage walk with, you know, pretend food food but they were but really it was the copy about the food it was you know move over disgusting burger you know it was oh, it was so clever 
really so clever. I, I loved that. I'd love to see some videos of that one. Yeah, and, and we've made lots of videos. That's another thing okay. that's really great to do with students, I think. Enter competitions, win money. You know, I mean, it can, those things can be done. There are things out there. And and once you have a little money, then you're thinking, what now? Now what can we do? And so, what do you do? Spend it. <laughs> spend it on 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 more, you know. <laughs> Buy green spandex suits, you know. <laughs> and, you know, figure out what you're going to do with those. I mean, there's there's all kinds of things. Yeah. You know, we I remember when we wanted the school to do, we had done a, an energy audit, and we wanted them to do the lighting retrofit that was recommended. It was a $75,000 lighting retrofit, but the energy company was going to pay 50000 of that. So it was going to cost the city $25,000, and they would save $33,000 a year. That's and a they no-brainer. Said, a no-brainer, yeah. Yeah. right? And they said, you know, because, I mean, the stack of things that schools, the 130 schools in the Boston public school system needs is astronomical. Endless. Yeah. Endless. Yeah. So they said, we really can't do that. So we had a fundraiser and we raised money, $7,400. And we went to them again and said, we got $7,400. We'll give you towards it. And they were like, oh, God, we, we can't take your money. Okay, we'll do the life <laughs> retro. And all of the stuff was put in my name. That fall, I was getting calls from truckers saying, I have uh, a shipping order with Kate Arnold's name on it. Like, you know, flats of light bulbs and lighting fixtures showed up with my mm -hmm. name on them. Uh -huh. I, I, somebody, but you didn't do all the installation, right? No, I didn't. I, <laughs> I didn't do any of it. It was just crazy. I think somebody did that on purpose. <laughs> I want to talk about your history teaching. Because, yeah. you, you know, you've been engaging with students on all these kind of hands-on activities. Does that come back into the classroom? All the time, yeah. I mean, I talk – there's lots of ways to talk to students in a history class about sustainability and have it be part of the picture. I mean, even in terms of saying why is it important to know the history we were handed, think about – and I, and one of the examples I use early in the year is – so. How do you think people felt in 1803 when the country doubled in size with the Louisiana Purchase? Do you think they had a sense of – do you think American identity was kind of tied to a sense of vast, limitless resources? Yeah, they, they all pretty much think that that was the case. Do you think American identity may still be tied to a sense of vast, limitless resources even though it doesn't – serve us as well today. How many people think that? And the hands all go up. So, you know, the importance of studying history is to be able to unpack the suitcase that we've been handed from the past that we're actually living out of and decide, you know, what parts of it are serving us today, what parts of it aren't serving us, you know, how, how do we want to be? What do we want to do with all of this? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that crosses all kinds of, I mean, We've been focused a lot in my classroom for the last couple of years on racism and, you know, really trying to think about that. And, of course, that's an issue of sustainability, too, because if Absolutely. you don't if you don't address those issues, it's not sustainable. It's just not. I mean, e economic sustainability, social justice, it's all. So there's lots of ways to bring that into the classroom. And, you know, a lot of times my students, they, I give them extra credit to, you know, to do some sort of community service. You want to help with the light bulb drive that we're selling to raise money? I'll give a little extra credit for that because, it. I mean, I'm trying to help students become civically engaged. And it's a way that they can support something that's, if they think it's important, that they can do that. I give them all kinds of other opportunities for extra credit, too. But Well, let's stay with that a bit about becoming civically engaged. How else has the youth can affected your students? My eighth grade history students? Any any, any but, students that have been in youth can. So most of the How, what's kids. What's the difference that, in their lives because of having been touched by you or youth can, do you think? Well, I mean, they would be better to speak to that than, than I am really. But I've seen students grow in confidence in their speaking ability. Mm -hmm. I mean, some have gone on to do things directly related to the field and others haven't. But I, I don't think that the consciousness and the you know, ability to think in terms of how all of this stuff relates, you know, ever leaves. You don't, you, you don't step back from that. That mm -hmm. doesn't go away. So, I mean, I think that's the biggest impact probably is, 
when you're asking yourself, you know, what do we need to do here environmentally? You're also having to think, what do we need to do in terms of social justice? What do we need to do economically? How do we need to, you know, consider all the stakeholders? I mean, it's... It's a whole different framing of the issues. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, all of this makes me think of what you said earlier about system thinking. Yeah. Do your students get it? I think I think they do. I, I think they get it more intuitively initially, and then they become articulate about explaining it. I mean, we were in D.C. for an award in June, and we were telling the staffer in Elizabeth Warren's office why we really wanted their help at the state level in Massachusetts pushing for education for sustainability in the broadest possible way because mm-hmm. it fits with everything that is needed and it's not I, it's not just about climate change of course it's it's that big picture thinking so did your i'm assuming your students went with yeah, you yeah and one of them immediately wrote back and applied for an internship in her <laughs> office so there you go i mean you know that's that's tends to be what happens that kids go on to do i mean susan's working this summer She's a junior. She's Susan Tang. As, yep. In, uh, in Representative Kennedy's yep, office, I yep, think she Joe said. Joe Kennedy's yeah. office. Mm-hmm. And Rebecca Park worked in Elizabeth Warren's office for a summer. Mm-hmm. Great experience. Yeah, great experience. Great, mm-hmm. great experience. So what's on the horizon now? What uh, you, You've been working so fabulously the last 11, 12 years. And... <laughs> More of the same. I mean, I you know, the ultimate goal is to figure out how to institutionalize the changes, the thinking, so that when I retire, which I will have to do someday, that it doesn't all go away, that it wasn't the belonging of one teacher Mm -hmm. and the passion of one teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's always a challenge. How do you make this part of the, this big school of 2,400 students and, you know, a whole bunch of faculty who come and go and come and go? How does it become part of the fabric of that place and part of the fabric of the larger society, you know, is there a way we could hand off the summit to somebody else, you know, or, or some other teacher at our school? Sure. You know, I, I keep trying to draw in other schools in ownership of the event, you know, to have it be more, not just a Boston Latin School organized thing. It's complicated because, you know, that makes even more meetings that you have to have yeah. and yeah. figure out who's doing what. And So is there a kind of coalition that's formed across the schools and the... We tried, and there were a bunch of schools early on. We tried to be an actual network. And at the peak, probably there were probably 32 or so schools that were mm-hmm. listing themselves as youth can mm-hmm. groups. We never had the bandwidth, given all the other stuff that we were doing, to make that happen in terms of like maybe, you know, bi-yearly meetings where we would set an agenda for the group as a whole sure. and then talk about what, you know, showcase what students were doing at their different schools, maybe at the summit. We had kind of an idea of what that youth network might look like and maybe it would be sort of legislative pushes. We, we tried also to partner with older um, so 20-somethings, you know, in either 350.org or Massachusetts for a Brighter Future. There mm-hmm. was, it was called something earlier before that. And, you know, we were trying to kind of connect with them and see if they could facilitate those meetings, the Alliance sure. for Climate Education. Um, there were people there for a while that we were trying to get to do that. I mean, I would still welcome <laughs> a grant and funding and, you know, a, an organization that wanted to try to make that happen because I think there's a place for it. With ACE or whomever. Or whomever, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's I, it's not at the top of my list because, you know, there's just more things that that we're trying to do in terms of institutionalizing the summit and doing things at our school to make sure that it happens and Plus, I'm sure the administrators are expecting you to continue teaching history oh, to eighth graders. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So. It's not as if your plate isn't already very right, full. Right, right. Yeah. So let's say that MacArthur Foundation came to you and said, here's the check. You can put as many zeros as you want. <laughs> I always thought that would be Sumner Redstone. Okay, so <laughs> The Sumner Redstone green roof. Doesn't that sound good? It's like red and green. It sounds beautiful. <laughs> but... What would you want to do? Like, meaning if you wanted to leave a legacy for your students, for Boston Latin, for other schools, 
What do you think is the most pressing thing to do? I still would have loved to have put a state-of-the-art shared sustainability center on the roof of that school that other schools, where the plan initially was that they could access it externally, that other schools would come there. I mean, I had, we had, the kids had envisioned all kinds of things, like a Prue 2 we were going to have with those scenes that you get from the Prudential Tower, and you would be able to do computer overlays of, you know, how to deal with brown space and how to, or brown fields, I, I've forgotten, and, and food deserts and asthma locations, and that you would be teaching these big ideas of sustainability from this rooftop learning center that had all kinds of different ways to access information and people would come and do that there. And you'd have to have somebody that would run it. And mm -hmm. But I just thought it's such a good thing for the city of Boston to have students having that targeted information about how to think about these things mm -hmm. and making it apparent to them, you know, teaching in that way. Teaching educators, I mean, I would love to have there be some, you know, summer training for teachers that is required. Well, as it so turns out, I have Sumner Redstone on fast dial <laughs> right here, so we'll, we'll just make it happen. Summer. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So what gives you hope? Well, the, the students, I mean, because they're amazing and, mm -hmm. and because, because they can do anything. They're so passionate and smart and, you know, capable. And you just, you never know what's going to happen next. I mean, I also think that change comes in these weird fits and starts. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, as discouraging a time as this is in so many ways, profoundly, I, I, I wonder sometimes if it isn't inspiring people to do exactly what we need them to do. Amen to that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this extended interview cut. Please be sure to check it out in context in the prior episode for Next Gen Learning to Change with Boston Latin School Youth Can. The Climate Conversations podcast is engineered and edited by Dave Lashansky. Project and media support is by my MIT Open Learning colleagues, Laura Howells and Michaela Joyce. Please subscribe and rate us wherever you find your podcasts. Join the community on climate.mit.edu and be in touch at Twitter, climatex underscore MIT, and Facebook, group named MIT Climate. For my co-hosts, Rajesh Kasturi-Rangan and Dave Damlor, I'm Kurt Newton. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>